Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, I'm Nicholas Gordon, host of the Asian Review of Books podcast done in partnership with the New Books Network. In this podcast, we interview fiction and nonfiction authors working in, around, and about the Asia-Pacific region. The Middle East remains one of the world's most complicated, thorny, and perhaps uncharitably unstable parts of the world, as countless headlines make clear. Internal strife, regional competition, and external interventions have been the region's history for the past several decades. Robert Kaplan, author, foreign policy thinker, longtime writer in international affairs, has written about what he terms the, quote, Greater Middle East, a region that spans from the Mediterranean south to Ethiopia and eastwards to Afghanistan and Pakistan for decades. These insights are the foundation of his latest book, The Loom of Time Between Empire and Anarchy from the Mediterranean to China. In this book, Kaplan criticizes how the U.S. has approached the region, intervention, and regime change, including his own mea culpa for his previous support for the 2003 invasion of Iraq, only for Washington to look somewhere else when newly formed regimes inevitably disappoint. Robert D. Kaplan is the best-selling author of 20 books on foreign affairs and travel, including Adriatic, The Good American, The Revenge of Geography, Asia's Cauldron, Monsoon, The Coming Anarchy, and Balkan Ghosts. He holds the Robert Strauss Hupe Chair in Geopolitics at the Foreign Policy Institute Research Institute. For three decades, he reported on foreign affairs with the Atlantic. He was a member of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board and the U.S. Navy's Executive Panel. Today, Robert and I talk about his idea of the greater Middle East, some of the experiences that most stood out to him in writing the book, and his conclusions on how to think about democracy, order, and anarchy in this part of the world. So, Robert, thanks so much for coming on the show to talk about the loom of time between empire and anarchy from the Mediterranean to China. Um, you know, it seems like kind of, kind of the organizing principle about your book, which covers this kind of such a vast region in, in so many different countries, is this idea sort of of, let's say, the the greater Middle East, you know, um, these countries beyond just the Gulf, um, like Turkey, like Syria, like Ethiopia that you still see as part of this one kind of larger region. What do you mean when you when you talk about this part of the world? What kind of binds this region together? Um, yes, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you, Nicholas, on the Asian Review of Books podcast. Um, what binds this region together is it's between, literally, between Europe or the Mediterranean and China. It's between, because India and China are these lush landscapes, you know, these age-old civilizational, unitary civilizations, and what lies in between is arid. It's desert or steppe. Um, it has loose soils. And it's it's never had any kind of unit unitary form of government. Um, it's you know different different forms of government, different uh, tribes, uh, you know different uh, civilizations. You have Arabs, you have Persians, you have uh, Amharic in Tigrayan, Ethiopians, etc. It's literally everything that lies between Europe and the Mediterranean and and the Indian subcontinent in China, which historically has been very unstable. Uh, you know, that's the key to it. It's been very unstable and it's been ruled by empires where it's been hard for states to get a grip on things. Um, you know, you've you've covered this region extensively, including in several books. I, I've, I've read some of your books like Monsoon before. Um, but what pushed you to write this book? What pushed you to write The Loom of Time, this kind of more overarching work? Because I realized I had 50 years of experience in the greater Middle East. And I also was very much opposed to how the Middle East is covered by American intellectuals and European intellectuals. They, you know, they're obsessed with promoting democracy. If you don't see a future for democracy in the region, it means you're a pessimist, you're negative. And I revolted against that. Um, and also, um, when they thought, when all these intellectuals talked about empire in the Middle East, they talked about the British and French, uh, or the Italians in Libya. And but this was only the last decades of empire that went back th a thousand years or so. So I felt it. I felt I needed to to kind of 
um, to describe how the imperial history of the Middle East begins like in late antiquity and how just because a, na- a place is not does not have a prospect for democracy doesn't mean it's a failure or that it's going nowhere. You know, so you mentioned your your 50 years of reporting um, and so much of this book is based off that, you know, both recent and not so recent. Um, are there any kind of particular examples uh, that you think most shaped your view of of this region? Yes, one is um, the Arabian Gulf and Saudi Arabia, uh, which are clearly not democracies with no prospect of being democracies, yet they're well-governed, they're technocratically governed, there's a social contract between ruler and ruled, whereby the ruler provides capable, efficient, um, stable governance and stable and quick transitions. When a ruler and when a leader dies, there's no hint of anarchy or disruption or civil of civil war or anything like that. In other words, they provide good government to people. And in return, the population agrees not to challenge the leader, not to question who leads them. And this is a social contract that goes against all of the, you know, all European and American theory about democracy. And it works and it's stable. I'll give you an example. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I had a conversation with someone and he said to me, he said, look, the ruling family of Saudi Arabia, the, the Al Sauds, have been in power for over a hundred years. During that time, there's been about six or so changes of regime because the leader died. Or in the case of King Faisal in 1975, was assassinated. In every single one of those cases, within a day or two, there was a new leader who went on to rule for a decade or more, very stably, very competently from a moderate conservative point of view. And this man was saying, should we exchange that for your American experience, experiments in democracy in Tunisia, which led to a vast drop in income standards, a vast drop in security, or, or Libya, where the Americans intervened and it led to absolute chaos and the breakup of the state, or Syria, which led to you know vast chaos, or Iraq, where the U.S. invaded and it led to chaos, or Yemen, where the Europeans and the Americans were just so determined to get rid of the dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had been in power for 30 years stably, Uh, And they got rid of him, and that led to a civil war, which then led to the Iranians to intervene, and that led to the Saudis to intervene with vast vast loss of life and property. So this man in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia was saying, should we want that? You know, Lee, you know, you Americans should stop lecturing us on the kind of system we should have. Um, I do want to I do want to talk about that point a little bit more in a second. But I but you mentioned Saudi Arabia and I and there's this great line um in the chapter of Saudi Arabia where you write, you know, countries usually surprise and delight upon the first immediate contact. Saudi Arabia does not. Um, you know, I, I've not been to Saudi Arabia myself. Um, you know, what's it actually like there on the ground? Um it's kind of like Texas. Um, but not Austin, which is very yeah. sophisticated yeah. and European and everything. It's like West Texas. It's flat. It's dusty. A grid pattern to streets in Riyadh. It's completely without any charm. Um, but yet, and there's no alcohol. Um, and all the signs are in Arabic. Uh, there are much fewer English signs in Saudi Arabia than in, say, Dubai or the United Arab or um, or Abu Dhabi or a place like that. And yet, you meet the most sophisticated, intelligent people. You meet lots of Saudis who've all been educated in the United States, not at Ivy League schools, but in places like the University of Texas, Indiana University, the University of Kansas, et cetera, who are real basic 
bottom line, analytical, uh, empirical, Machiavellian, and um, and, and there, you know, and and you you know, you it's a real high standard of intellect that you meet there, and they're all realists. Mm. Um, so I want to get at this at, at this point that people in Saudi Arabia raised, you know, the this idea that um, democracy leads to disorder, uh, and you know that 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 that's bad for the economy, bad for development. I mean, obviously, that's an argument that gets brought up outside of the Middle East. I'm thinking particularly of, you know, parts of Asia. You know, people in China make this point. People in Vietnam make this point. Um, other places in Asia make this point. I mean, is 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 that argument when expressed outside the Middle East, is that the same argument or is there something about the Middle East in particular that makes this argument I, that I, I think it's different? a more um, insistent extreme mm -hmm. argument in the Middle East than in Asia. Because in Asia, you've had Park Chung-hee in South Korea, Lee Kuan Yew mm -hmm. in Singapore, the, uh, you know, the Vietnamese regime, who basically created middle classes um, and provided good quality of life um, as a precursor to democracy or to more freedom. In other words, in the Middle East, you've had these horrible exper experiments with democracy in Libya, in Syria, in, in, in Iraq, um, in Yemen. Um, and Tunisia, though, wasn't a disaster. It was, it was going downhill for a decade until it, democracy gave up the ghost and autocracy came back. So it's a more um, emotional argument in the Middle East than it is in Asia, but it's essentially the same argument. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about maybe a few other countries mentioned in in your book. Um, you know, perhaps we can talk about about Syria, which um, obviously has been in conflict for a long time now. Um, you know, you, you kind of mentioned this this argument that people make, you know, that that Syria and countries of the region are in perpetual conflict because the borders are fake. The borders were kind of imposed by by the French or the British. Um, and this is this is this is the root cause of all the problems. Um, I get the impression that that you are not quite as convinced that that it has such an easy that 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 the cause is so easily defined. No, the causes are complex. Borders. Um, remember. Um, for hundreds of years, for 400 years, the Ottoman Turks ruled Sir ruled everything from Algeria to Iraq. And before the Turks, you had a succession of Arab dynasties. You had the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Fatimids, the Hafsids, and they also governed essentially from North Africa to Iran or, you know, a, a, around there. And therefore, there was very little development of individual states because the imperial authority was far away. And also because this whole area was under an empire that was far away, nobody had arguments about borders, um, essentially, you know, because everyone owed, owed fealty to the Turkish sultan, for instance. Um, it was, And Tunisia had an identity as a state going back to late Roman times. And Egypt, of course, goes back to antiquity. But in the main, you had very weak artificial state development. And this, in turn, made it harder to, for these places to have any identities outside of religion. And that, in turn, led to a, you know, a difficulty in establishing any sort of civil or democratic rule. So it's, it's the legacy of imperialism. It's, it, it's borders that are artificial. Um, and it's the role also, as I point out in the book, of radical Islam, for instance, in a case like Egypt, where the dictator rules and he's afraid to give up power because the Muslim Brotherhood will come back. Um, you know, at, at the beginning of your book, you you push back a little bit against the ideas put forward in, um, you know, Edward Said's Orientalism. Um and you kind of say it's it's maybe led to a distortion in how we understand the region. Um, could I ask you to to explain that 
argument a little bit more. Yes. You see, the key words you used was a little bit. I did push back, but not a lot. I I define Saeed, you know, in terms of this incredible intellectual, uh, no holds barred um, battle that he fought with the late Bernard Lewis. Um, both men are deceased now. Um, Edward Said was a professor at Columbia University in English literature, and Bernard Lewis was uh, fluent in Arabic, fluent in Persian, fluent in Turkish, um, and he taught Middle East history at Princeton University. And the two men got in this fierce argument in 1982. And this is ancient history, mm -hmm. but I bring it back to life um, because Saeed's point was essentially that only Middle Easterners can know their own country and know their own civilization. That And that people like Bernard Lewis imposed upon them kind of definitions and descriptions that were rooted in the West, not in the Middle East itself. And rather than take a side of saying one man's right, one man's wrong, I tried to show the intelligence and the brilliance of both of them, mm -hmm. essentially, and how this argument resonates up until today. And I did point out that, but you know, that Edward Said, in terms of development, has certainly won the battle. That, that you know, he may not have won the argument, but it's his world today, um, because um, you know, in, in 1982, you had no Arabs covering. Uh, um, Arab countries. You only had European Westerners cover them. Now, of course, you have upper middle class Ivy League educated Arabs covering their own countries for, for the large nudes organizations and defining their own countries in their own ways with all of the nuances in everything. So Edwards, it's Edward Said's world now, but I, I push back saying it's an ironic victory because Bernard Lewis um, also had this brilliant facility to describe history and to say that anyone should be allowed to you know, make judgments on the Arab world or the Persian world, not just Arabs themselves and not just Persians. So you mentioned in this interview already, and um, it's very clear throughout your book that you're um, not a fan of how U.S. policymakers, commentators, journalists think and talk about the region. Um, you know, I'm a I'm I came of age during the 2000s, so obviously I grew up when the Iraq War was going on. I was not a fan, um, uh, both before it happened and during. Um, then also, like I was in college during the Arab Spring, so I I mean I I. I personally was aware of all these developments when I was when I was growing up. Um, but you see, but you see, kind of there, there, there's this long running problem in the way U.S. people talk about the Middle East, and they seem to talk about a way that always sets them up for disappointment. Um, they have they have yeah. bold hopes yeah. of what's going to happen, then they get disappointed and then check out once once they don't get what once those aims are not achieved within like a year or two. Kind of, but but what's your sense of what the U.S. gets? wrong about yeah the region. you see the problem with the washington elite has been that it sees um um that it sees american history and the american historical experience with mass democracy as 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 more important Important to these individual Middle Eastern countries than their own history themselves. In other words, Egypt's history doesn't matter. It's America's, it's American values and its experience with democracy that matters more than Egypt's own experience, etc. So it's about fo foisting our values and our judgments onto these places. And that, as you said, Nicholas, sets us up for um, extreme disappointment. You know, we say, you know, we keep in mind that Britain, but the time between Magna Carta, where the king gave some rights to the nobles, and the great reform acts of the late 19th century and women's suffrage in the early 20th century was like 700 years. 
So it took Great Britain 700 years to essentially perfect democracy. Yet we expect these places to turn overnight into democracies and criticize them and threaten to deny them aid if they don't hold an election within six months. Um, you know, I guess just to kind of stick on this on this on this democracy point, I mean, you, you conclude that that if we want stability in this region, we need to um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the word tolerate, you know, tolerate some of these authoritarian regimes. Maybe they're quite open or reasonably open, maybe reasonably liberal, but still authoritarian rather than kind of the 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 chaos that comes with with speedy democratization. I'll use that term. Um, yeah. I mean, how how I mean, what does that mean in terms of, I guess, what U.S. foreign policy towards the region should be? Um, you know, how should we think about this balance? I, I'll ask this question again in, in a slightly different way later, but I do want to ask this kind of more policy-oriented question first. Yeah, I think our policy should not be about uh, forcing democracy at, gun, at gunpoint or at, at aid point. Uh, instead of uh, being legalistic and demanding elections in parliamentary procedures, we should talk about some basic values like freedom of speech, protection of minorities, a predictable tax system where land cannot be appropriated, uh, expropriated. You know, if, if countries abide by a number of these things, the fact that they don't hold an election is secondary. We should stick to basic points of values and not get legalistic about demanding elections. Um, because that's what gets us in trouble. Mm. Um, you've kind of already answered this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. You know, um, you know, if you do think that democracy is important, um, what would it have to take for democratization to work? So you've kind of already answered this question, but but if you do believe that democratization is a worthy objective. I guess, how do we recognize how hard that's going to be? And, you know, again, what are the sorts of things that you would then support to to do the, the slow and difficult work towards democratization? Well, I think if you look from Morocco to Iraq, you will not find one country that has had a successful experience in democracy. Nor is there one country in this vast region where, where it looks like, a, where democracy seems like a viable, uh, realistic prospect. So when people say that the Middle East should be a democracy, I say, give me one example. Mm -hmm. And there's no examples to give. People were talking a lot about Sudan, how Sudan was a democracy. Well, Sudan has collapsed into chaos, if anyone has noticed, um, kind of. Well, as again, what we should be trying to export is values. Mm -hmm. And if, if you know, you know, because, you know, as a foreign correspondent, I don't see the world in black and white as good democracies and bad dictatorships. What I've seen is a lot of gray shades, um, you know, a lot of democracies that around the world, not just in the Middle East, that don't function very well, and authoritarian states, which are fairly liberal um, in many ways. It's a mixture. It's a real mixture. We shouldn't go around micromanaging the kind of governments people have. And this was accepted during the Cold War. Our Cold War presidents were not interested in democratizing Egypt or Syria or any place, but just in working with them on the basis of shared interests. Um, and I think that's what we're going back to now. Um, is um, yeah, you know, is working with places on the basis of shared interests. Um, that said, um, Egypt is um, Egypt. I don't see has a good future because um, you know the regime is out of options, and yet there's no prospect of democracy because of the danger of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Syria is in chaos. Tunisia is probably the only place where you might see a reintroduction of democracy in the near or middle term. Uh, you know, that's about the only example of a major country that I can think of in the Middle 
totally, you know, like that. Mm. Um, thank you for listening to interview with Robert Kaplan, author of The Loom of Time Between Empire and Anarchy from the Mediterranean to China. Robert, I do have two final questions for you, um, which are, uh, where can people find your work? I know there's a lot of it, but where can they find uh, all of your work? And number two, what's next? What do you think the next project might be? Yeah, well, they can find my work on Amazon, like most authors. You know, all my 22 books are on Amazon. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, you know, I've done uh, almost 20 of those 22 books with Random House. Um, so I've stayed with them for 30 years. So I'll be finding another publisher soon. Um, and, uh, so, uh, you know, so and in terms of my essays, they're kind of all over the place. For uh, 30 years, I wrote for The Atlantic. Um, um, but I haven't written for them for about five years. The magazine has changed. Uh, I've changed. And my next project is I'm coming out with a book next year with Random House. Uh, with a, um, it has a, a, a you know, a, a provisional title of Wasteland, a world in permanent crisis. It's a short book, almost like a, a long essay. Um, and it's about the, 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 the philosophical and structural and other factors that contribute to a world that seems out of control. So you can follow me, Nicholas Gordon, on Twitter at Nick R. I. Gordon. That's N-I-C-K-R-I-G-O-R-D-O-N. You can go to AsianReviewBooks.com, find other reviews, essays, interviews, and excerpts. Follow on Twitter at Book Reviews Asia. That's reviews plural. And you can find many more author interviews at the New Books Network at NewBooksNetwork.com. We're on our favorite podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Rate us, recommend us. Share us with your friends, support us, interviewing those running in, around, and about Asia. Join us next week for a conversation with Jonathan Chatwin, author of The Southern Tour, Deng Xiaoping and the Fight for China's Future. But before then, Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was my pleasure, Nicholas. Goodbye. <laughs>